Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vineyardchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. Now here's this week's message. How are you? Well, we are starting the new year with a brand new series that is called Brand New. So it's a brand new series, right? And um, one of the things that I'm excited about is I'm hoping to take us on a journey over the next three weeks and look at what it means to be brand new and how to really make 2017 a great year. Over the last few years, particularly last year, we had people make commitments, families make commitments to Christ. And one of the things that happens is they go, when, when somebody gets serious with God and says, I really want to uh, get my life right with God and draw near to God, they say, what's next? What's the next step? And there are next steps. Let me, I want to just point three key things that a Christ follower who is really wanting to to go the distance, really want to get right, you know, make their life count for God and have a great year, they will do these three things. First of all is a baptism, baptism. Now, we have a baptism coming up in, um, on February 4th and 5th, that weekend. Some of you haven't been baptized, and this is your opportunity. This is your time. Now, you may have been christened as a child or dedicated or had a child baptism and there's that i'm glad for that there's nothing wrong with that and this certainly doesn't undo that uh, but those are more uh, a form of dedication uh, from usually your parents uh, where baptism what we see in the bible happens after you make a commitment to christ it's generally an adult decision where somebody says i see uh, how i've fallen from you know i've lived a life that's not pleasing to God, and, and then they get right with God, and then they make a public declaration with baptism, kind of like a wedding band. Oh, baptism is kind of like, you know, this is, you tell the world th about an inward decision, something that's happening in your life. So baptism is very, very powerful, very important. Number two, once you become a follower of Christ, is to get in a small group. There's nothing wrong with a large group like we're in right now. It's fun. It's, there's a, we can do a lot. It's real celebratory. Read the word. But here's small groups where we really grow. Where our spiritual, I've talked to many, many people, including myself, over the years, and said, where did you really grow in your life spiritually? They always come back. It happened in a small group. People who knew me, people who could encourage one another. This is where that happens. We'll talk about this more in just a moment. But I just want to just say right up front that if you're not in a small group, it can actually be dangerous. Bad things can happen to you if you don't get in a small group. And let me show you, I want to show you a video to kind of d illustrate what kinds of things happen if you're not in a small group. Watch this. When you don't join a small group, you get stuck at home. When you get stuck at home, then those neighbors find out. When those neighbors find out, you have to entertain them. When you entertain them, you do something drastic. When you do something drastic, you go on the run. When you go on the run, you get caught. When you get caught, you get thrown in the slammer. And when you get thrown in the slammer, you become acquainted with Bruiser. Don't become acquainted with Bruiser. Join a small group. Visit the foyer to learn more. <laughs> so, um, that actually happened. No, that's, but those are the kinds of, I mean, you don't, being in a small group is good for you. So, Sammy's going to talk to you a little more about why we do small groups and how you can get involved. Awesome. Well, thank you. Well, as Pastor Andy said, we're starting our new semester, our winter spring semester of small groups this weekend. Um, what that is, a lot of our vineyard groups took break, breaks over the holiday season and our Virginia Beach blizzard. Um, but now they're getting ready to start back up. And it's a great time to jump in if you ha haven't been a part of one or you were involved and then kind of stop going. And, you know, it's just every, most of the groups are starting new studies or, you know, just starting new seasons. They're all, you know, kind of beginning anew. So it's a great time to jump back in. And all our vineyard groups are, they're just simple groups of people, part of our church family, that uh, it's a place to make new friends, as Daniel said, grow in the faith, and, uh, you know, have fun. That's all it is. It's no big commitment. 
Uh, it's not a big scary thing. You can invite your friends. It's real, you know, it's an easy thing to be a part of, okay? And we have, it, you should have gotten a uh, piece of paper in your sh seats when you walked in, and you'll see on that here, I'll give you one. Okay, so thanks. On that sheet is all of the different types of groups we have. We have our connect groups, which are our classic home, you know, study groups. Uh, most people have heard of those. We have our victory groups, which those are uh, help the members grow in certain areas of life and have success. And our training groups are like Financial Peace University and kind of our classroom type groups. And our affinity groups are, you know, revolve around a social event like flag football or we have a softball group, you know, different ones. And if you don't see a group, we're always looking to start new ones. So there's an opportunity to lead there as well. So you're probably wondering what this is. Well, this is part of our launch weekend. It's our carnival wheel. And part, we're playing kind of a game with you guys. So that sheet on the other side, you'll see there's two questions. All right, and now those two questions, all you have to do is get those answered. So you go up to one leader after service, though all the small group leaders will be out in the, you saw the cafe in four, you looked a little different. Well, they'll all be out there after service with orange name tags just like this. And you just have to ask one of them, any of them, those two questions. And if you get those answers, Pastor Jacob will be manning this wheel and you show him and you get to spin and you get to win a prize. And you can see we have different prizes. One of them is five hour energy drink. Uh, if you're too tired to go to small group, you can pop one of those. They're terrible <laughs> for your health though. We have uh, icebreakers, because you know, you break the ice at small group. <laughs> All right. Well, you like this one then, because this is Pastor Andy's idea. Kit Kat bar when you need a break from life. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, he wanted to spin the wheel. Yeah, spin yeah, I'm wheel. ready. Spin okay. the wheel. Let's see what I won. Skittles. Ooh. All right. Skittles. Everybody loves Skittles. Now, Skittles are because we have fun and that's contagious. <laughs> and there's a Skittles commercial where they have like the Skittle pox and the girl eats it off his face. And it's kind of gross. Sharon, we're going to have fun with this later. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will see you guys after service. All right. Thanks. So small groups, very important. And one small group that if you're new with us and you haven't been part of uh, a small group before is we encourage you to get involved in Vineyard 101. It's just a one-time meeting, but it's a place where it is a small group. You get to meet some other people, talk to them, and um, that's meeting right after service today. Uh, it's our membership class. You can come in. You'll learn about it. I teach it. Sharon will be there. We kind of, you, you meet different people. It's, it'll really help you get a good understanding of the Vineyard and where we're going and, uh, and if you'd want to become a member at the end of that, you can. It's really a great way to get started. Third, so you have baptism. You have small groups. And then we thought to launching this, this 2017, no better way than through prayer. So we started something this past Monday called 21 Days of Prayer and Fasting. Of Prayer and Fasting. And what that means is you're saying, hey, I'm not, I, haven't, I didn't get started with that. Well, we'll jump in now. For you, it wouldn't be 21 days, you know, it's going to be a few less, but still a great way to, to participate and, and get involved in, uh, in, in connecting with God. 21 days, what we are doing, uh, for anybody who wants to come, we're opening up the building at 6 in the morning, 6 to 7, we're praying. We generally have anywhere from uh, 15 to 20 or 30 people that show up, and we, and we just pray. Uh, together, we pray corporately. We pray over the cards. If you have a prayer request on your Connect card, write there a prayer request. We'll be praying for those Monday through Friday, 6 a.m., and then Saturday at 9. Great way to pray. And then fasting, just something of the world. It doesn't have to be food. Some people are fasting food. Other people are skipping a meal. Some people are just fasting from social media or a game station Something like Jacob, Pastor Jacob was telling me one of his youth, a lot of the youth are involved in this. He said one of his youth had decided he was not going to, uh, he was going to fast from, from playing, uh, you know, the Xbox. And, and he said that, of course, they didn't have school for three days, right? And he said, he goes, Pastor Jacob, I, I couldn't take it. I, I fell to the temptation. I just saw my game station there. So he goes, so he, he's rebooting. So sometimes we need to, sometimes we need to start over, you know, and that's okay. You know, it's, it's, we're, we're trying our best just to say, you know what, I'm going to focus on God and give God my very best. So these are three great ways. Now, 
as I said, I'm hoping to bring you on a spiritual journey over the next three weeks where you'll discover what God's great plan is for you. Now, one of the ways to discover God's plan is looking in the Bible and looking what God has to say about it. If you look in Revelation 21, it's on your outline. You can also open it up if you want to follow us in your own Bible. But on, in, in Revelation 21, God describes his great plan for you. In fact, when you go to heaven, this is what you will experience. He's kind of unveiling, pulls away the curtain, says this is what's going to happen. When you get to heaven, he's going to, it's, he's going to say he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. You see, this life has a fair amount of discouragement. There's a lot of pain. These things are part of life. Life can be very difficult. He goes, in heaven, that's not going to happen anymore. And uh, all those things that caused you pain and hardship, that's over. He says, for the old order of things has passed away. He says, There's the best is yet to come. He goes, it's going to be amazing what happens. And then he says, he who is thro seated at the throne, that's in verse 5, that's Jesus, said, and this is the first thing you'll hear when you get to heaven. He says, I am making everything new. That's his vision. I'm making everything. Everything new is kind of cool. Everybody likes new, right? I mean, you get a new car or you get some kind of something new and you think, wow, this is really nice. This is, this is new. I mean, and God's big on new. God loves new. Not necessarily new cars, but that's not like a justification. I can go get a new car now. No, but he loves new. We often settle for just improved. You know, if we can just like improve ourselves. That's what, you know, in 2017, like every turn every year people are making dedicate you know they're saying well you know i want to try to make a resolution i'm going to try to do something different and did you know that out of 80 percent of resolutions are are they, they people have given up on them by valentine's day six weeks into it they're going i can't do this and a lot of people they set their their uh their their sights even lower they're thinking i've tried resolutions they don't work is that true that's yeah, right they don't work because it's just we, we try our very best. We're trying to make a small improvement, and we just give up. We just say, well, you know, resolutions, they're just too hard to fulfill. I have a few three resolution examples to kind of show you how, how they kind of degrade. Watch this. Okay, first resolution one. 2015, you say, you know what? I'm going to work out five days a week. I'm going to really give it my best. Then by 2016, I'll work out three days a week. It's going the wrong direction. By 2017, I will try to drive past the gym at least once a week. <laughs> Have you ever felt like that? You just kind of, you keep lowering the bar. Here's another one, resolution two. I will read at least 10 books this year. 2016, I'll finish the last book I started. 2017, I'll be happy if I just finish the comic section, right? Okay, and then resolution three, I will pay off my bank loan this year. That's the resolution. By 2016, I'm going to pay off my bank loans this year. 2017, I'll be out of the country by the end of the year. <laughs> you know, we're just kind of, what hope is there? And this is often how resolutions are. We just kind of, you know, maybe if I make a small improvement, but when you look at what God says, he goes, I want to make everything new. I, wanna, I, I want it to be different for you. I want to, you go, yeah, but Andy, that's from when I get to heaven. But you know, God's plan for you, it doesn't begin when you die. God actually, what Jesus said, when we pray, pray, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, God's plan as described in heaven, he wants us to have that on earth. And the more we get that, the more we understand that, the more it's going to change our lives. Because God's inbreaking kingdom into your life. And it happens. As we, he makes us new. Notice this amazing verse here. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. He says, when someone becomes a Christian. Now, just pause for a second right there. How would most people fill that in? When somebody, if you go to work or you go to school and you say, when somebody becomes a Christian, what happens? Most people would say, not what the rest of the verse says, but they would say, oh, well, that means they become more religious. Oh, they start going to church, or they start giving money, or they start serving, or they get baptized, or they start taking communion, all those kinds of things. Not all those things are bad. Some of them are good. 
But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says when somebody becomes a Christian, notice what it says. It says he becomes a brand new person inside. He is not the same anymore. A new life has begun. And it's a whole new life, brand new. God's doing something in us. You see, the problem is when we try to do incremental things, when we try to do external things and add to us, and probably all of us might have done that, right? Or you might have done that. You know what? I need to change my life a little bit. I need to kind of do something. Maybe I better start going to church. Maybe that'll help me. Maybe I should read the Bible. And you open the Bible and you read it and you go, I don't understand this. I don't really like this. I'm miserable trying to live this way. You add stuff externally, it doesn't work. It just makes us miserable, makes us guilty, feel guilty, all those kinds of things. And that's not God's plan anyways. He says when somebody becomes a Christian, he becomes brand new inside. It's a whole different experience. It's not just a resolution, it's a revolution. God changes us. Now here's a couple of different ways of saying it. Uh, you Changing on the outside in or on the inside out. Whole different experience. One, the outside in, I'm just going to be do a resolution. I'm going to try to eat different. I'm, gonna ch I'm not going to eat as much chocolate. I'm going to try to back off on that. I'm going to try to exercise more. I'm going to try to change my schedule. I'm gonna, that's the ex but when we change from the inside out, it affects all of those areas. It absolutely will. Here's another way. Be, do something different or be somebody different. In other words, do I just add activities or do I change, let God change me from the inside? Third way is just improve the old you, just an, an improvement. Or become the new you. You've heard in the new and improved. Well, if it's improved, it's not new. It's either new or it's improved. And, we, and, and God says, I want to make you new. I want to change the way he interacts with us, the way we interact with the world, the way we see life, and the way we experience life, that he wants to make us new. Now, God intentionally set up a system that does not work. It's called the Old Testament. The, the Old Testament was... A, a, a system of external rules, a system of, of, of do's and don'ts, 613 of those, and that included the Ten Commandments that were written on a tablet. And what happened was people tried in their own effort to live up to that, and they couldn't. No matter how good they tried, no matter how hard they tried, how good of a person they were, they could not live up to it. They couldn't live up to God's standards. They couldn't live up to their own standards. And so God said, so that's the plan that he set up that doesn't work. And then he came up with a new plan. He goes, here's a new plan that I'm instituting. Notice what it, it talks about it in Hebrews. Hebrews, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. So there was the old covenant, the Old Testament. But he's making a new one that I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. Here it is. Ready? I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more, and where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. So he says, no longer is it on a tablet, some external force. He says, I'm going to write it right on your, your heart and your mind. See, that's totally different. It's one thing just to say, you know what, I'm going to buy a Bible or download a Bible app. I'm going to start reading it, and you're just trying to you read it and, 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 and obey it. That's impossible. It can't be done. It just frustrates us. God says, what I want to do is I'm going to write it on your heart. Then it changes your desires. And your whole approach to the Christian faith changes. All of the, your whole approach. And then he talks about the, the blood sacrifice. He says, the forgiveness. See, before it was just with animals and the blood of animals. And then, but we still felt bad. We still felt guilty. We still had uh, this conscience that's bothering us. And so he goes, no, Jesus is going to give a once and for all sacrifice that when we, when we put our faith in him, there's no more of that. And it cleans our conscience. It says it's, it's that we don't have to, have to deal with that anymore. You say, well, how does, that, how does that all work? How do we become new? Well, I'm glad you asked. Okay, because we're going to look at this next portion of Hebrews. It actually tells us how to change, let God make us new. And it changes our prayer life. Changes the way we read the Bible, changes the way we treat people, everything. Watch what it says. It says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, 
by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain. This is what Jesus did, the work on the cross. He, and then he says, and, and his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, he's talking about Jesus, and now he uses four let us. He says, these four things cause us to be transformed and have this new life. He says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So you have there four things that are listed. First of all, is to draw near to God. He says you draw near to God and this is the first thing that we do. There's, the, there's, there's a part of us, if we want to be close to God, we, 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 we need to draw close to God. And then it affects our family and our finances, everything, our diet, all of that. Then he says, hold on to God's promises. He says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And so there's, one translation says, hold on, hold on to God's promises. And it's talking about God's word. You see, the Bible is unlike any other book. It's a book, but it's not, not like any other book. I have books on Kindle. I have audio books. I have books in my library. I have a lot of books. You might have a lot of books. The Bible's not like those books. The Bible is active and living. It's, it has the power within itself to fulfill its own promises. That's why when we memorize the Bible and we think we start to live it out, the God's behind the Bible. There's, it's a living word. That's why the enemy doesn't want us to read the Bible because he knows that's unlocks this new life in our lives. And so reading the Bible, letting God work through us to, uh, in that way. Another thing that he says, and let us, is he talks about caring for others. Verse 24, he says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. So a secret to growing in your faith, to the spiritual journey, is recognizing that you, it's not just about me, that I have to be caring concerned about others. I have to care about others. Jesus actually says when we become a Christ follower that God says, I'm going to care for you. That kind of releases us. We can just go, oh, okay, it's not all about me anymore. God's got me so I can care about others. And that's part of the way we grow is by caring about others, letting people into our lives, letting them care for us. It's so frustrating from my perspective sometimes. Some people live on the periphery. They're just on the fringes. They come, every, you know, every week or every, every oh so often. They're not involved in any ministry. They're not involved in any small group. They're just out there on the periphery. And I, when I see them, I'll try to encourage them. Hey, you got to get involved. Do, do, you know, let people in. We had one guy in our church. He was with us for a number of years, at least 10, many, many years. And he never got involved. He'd come every week. I mean, every week he was, but the, he never got close to anybody. And I would tell him all the time, you know what? It's so, it would be so great for you to get involved. Let people into your life. Let you can get into their lives. And you would grow through that process. Nope, I'm solo. I'm a lone wolf, he would tell me. You know, he did some things for it, for the church as well. He'd help build some stuff, but he always did it alone. I said, Can't, you know, we have other people who'd love to, you know, do some woodworking with you. There's other, nope, all by myself. Last year, this guy died. He, he committed suicide. I didn't know he was dealing with that kind of depression and that kind of, that kind of stuff that's going on. Nobody did. He came for 10 years or longer. Nobody knew because he wouldn't let anybody in. So we ended up doing the funeral right here in this auditorium. It was, you know, it's so hard because we, we all got stuff. We all have things we're struggling with. When we don't let people in, when we're not part of that, we can't really connect to them, which is kind of the fourth point, which is to be part of an encouraging group, people that encourage you, people that challenge you to grow. Verse 25, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. You see, some of you, you're not growing because you're not in a small group. You're not in a place. You haven't allowed people to come in and challenge you and speak into your life. And, and when you come in, you, you, you know, hey, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. No, 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 you don't look fine. What's really going on? Well, since you seem to want to know, that's the kind of questions you get in a small group. 
here on a weekend, you know, it's a bit, you know, I'm fine. It's probably going to be where it stops. Hey, how you doing? I'm fine. Oh, good. See you next week. <laughs> Small group, it goes deeper. And we need one another. We grow from one another. Now, I want to just go over real quick these four points again, but this time I'm going to change it in the form of a question. Then we'll close. First one. Okay, first one. Because here's why I want you, this is so important. Because if you want 2017 to be the best year of your life, which it can be, it's got to be the best year of your life spiritually. Spiritually. Because you are a spiritual being. You're not an earthly being with having a spiritual experience. You are a spiritual being having an earthly experience. And the more you get that, the more you understand that, the more it's going to transform your life. And so if you have the best year of your life spiritually, this year, 2017, it will be the best year of your life. And here's the way to make it happen. Number one, you ask this question, am I worshiping intimately? In other words, am I drawing near to God? God says, you draw near to me. There's, we, need to, we, we, we need to do that. And God is actually looking for people that are interested in him. He's, he's seeking you. Notice there, in John, Jesus says in John 4, he says, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Who is he seeking? Is God seeking people that will have, you know, that will come to church? Is God seeking people that will get baptized? Is God seeking people that will give money? No, he's seeking worshipers. That's what he's seeking. Now that word worship is the Greek word preskano. You don't need to know that, but what it means is, what worship means is to kiss. Not romantically, but with enthusiasm, with excitement. Kind of like when you come home, if you have a dog and the dog's jumping all around, spinning around, licks your hand, he's excited you're home. When we worship God, we're excited to be in his presence. We're, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not just, oh, oh my goodness, here I am again. Okay, you better count this one. I'm really, you know, no, we, we're excited. There's this, that's what it means to worship, to really connect with God. Now, God has a great promise to us. Notice what he says. Is he says, come near to me and I will come near to you. You have a role to play. He says, you come near to me, I'm going to meet you there. Now, I know when I first started coming to a church like this, it wasn't this church. I, was, I came to Christ at 18. I think I, I, the first time I came to a church that was similar to this one was like, I was like 20. I remember, and I wasn't raised in this kind of church. I mean, I, I looked around and I thought, these people, they're weird, man. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think I can connect here. You know, I, they're too weird. You know, I don't know if I can do all that. Raising their hand, doing all the weird, you know, dance or whatever. I mean, just, uh. But I came back because they had something. I could, I could sense it. They, they, they had something that I needed, that I wanted. I was stale. I was stagnant. I wasn't growing in my faith. And I could see these people, they love the Lord. There's something that happened in there. So I kept coming. After, and I'd sit in the back, you know, just watch them. After a while, you know, I thought, I think I'll try to raise my hand. I'm waiting to see if anybody's looking. Nobody was looking. I put my hand up, put it down. <laughs> Woo, got one, you know. <laughs> then after, you know, as more weeks went by, hands went up, you know, like I'm carrying a TV. Carry the TV. <laughs> Carry the TV. <laughs> then after a while, I went to field goal. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you go to these NFL games, they're fired up. I mean, they get totally jazzed over, you know, some guys, 22 guys kicking, trying to kick a, you know, pass or kick a ball through a, some, a couple sticks. Everybody, yeah, you come to church, you're supposed to just be real quiet. Otherwise, you're a fanatic, right? You do it for some pigskin, yeah, you're a fan. You do it at church, you're a fanatic. The truth is, I, when you fall in love with God, this, this idea of worshiping God is certainly every bit as exciting as football. And so we love the Lord. And we're not ashamed about it. Here's another question. Am I feeding daily? Am I feeding daily? We're talking about reading God's word. That's, that's the way we feed our spirit is through God's word. Joshua said, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate it on day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then 
you will be prosperous and successful. And this is what we're trying to do. We're not trying to add burdens on each other. We're saying, no, we want to be prosperous and successful. How do we do that? By living out God's word. We read it. It's, it's living to us. Notice this verse in Psalm 119. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. In other words, I don't want to make any decisions without consulting God. I'm not going to take one step unless I know what God has to say about it. Your, lamp, your word is a lamp unto my feet. It guides me. Third, let us spur on one another to love and good deeds. Love and good deeds. So if you're going to grow and have spiritual growth, it's going to involve other people. It's going to involve other people. We don't do it alone. Here's, here's what you'll discover. When you start to serve, if you join one of our teams, like the Dream Team or some of the ministries that we do, we do all kinds of ministries here. I mean, we have a food pantry. We serve in the cafe, our greeters, our ushers. We have uh, all kinds of, on the missions team, all kinds of stuff. And when you serve, what you will discover is you benefit and you get more out of it than they do, the people you're serving. It's kind of a surprise, but I've seen it for years and years. People, okay, I'll serve. They better, and you can see it in their eyes. They better appreciate it because I'm busy. <laughs> and the next thing you know, they're going, I got so much out of that. I needed that. And it's true. We do need it. Because when we serve in God's economy, we grow spiritually. If you decide, hey, I'm going to host a small group, you, it'll help you. If you're married, it'll help your marriage. I mean, if you're arguing half an hour before 12 people are going to show up at your home, you're going to work that out, baby. <laughs> you're going to figure, figure something out, right? You'll grow. When we sign up for leadership, people expect things from us. I certainly make different decisions because I'm a leader in this church. I know you guys are counting on me. I know I'm accountable to you. I know if I screw up that I'll hurt a lot of people. Do you think that affects my decisions? No doubt, especially compared to if I was doing nothing, just laying around, not doing anything with my life. When we put ourselves in that kind of position, we, we grow. We grow spiritually. You want to grow spiritually? You need to be part of a serving team. You need to be part of that. So am I faithfully serving? Now, I love 1 Peter when he says, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. Faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. In other words, there's all kinds of forms. Some people lead small groups. Some people are sweeping. Some people are helping in the parking lot. Some people, you know, all kinds of services. We have people that help on our website, people that run our pro presenter, the slides up here. We have all kinds of the lighting, all, all this stuff. And listen, I, I want to say this without making you feel like weird, but we need you. We need you. It's not the same without you. If God placed you in this church, you have gifts that he wants you to use and we need. Now, it's working without you, but it would work better with you. We need you. And so you come in and you serve. Now, the final let us is let us not give up meeting together as some have gotten in the habit of doing. It's that, you know, we, we're creatures of habit. And so we can let that stuff happen. We're, we just stop meeting and and it's so important that when we are part of a small group, that's where we get connected with one another. That's, that, that's where people know us and they encourage us and they challenge us. And we all need that. We need that. I love this verse here in James 5. It's a powerful verse. Look, at, he says, therefore confess your sins. Now, normally we would think to God, right? Confess your sins to God. But it doesn't say that because it's, it's talking about the context of a small group. In a small group, you talk about your mistakes. I mean, everybody's got issues. You know, everybody got, you know, some people have addictive personalities, they have addictive things going on with pornography or with spending or with alcohol. Other people have self-destructive tendencies and they hurt themselves. They hurt their relationships with their kids or their parents. Or uh, We all have different things going on. And when we confess those things one to another, notice what it says. Therefore, confess your sins one to another, each other, and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Healing happens. Healing happens when we share our weaknesses and our struggles with one another. We pray for one another. That, that's important as well. We pray for one another. Something powerful happens. And that happens in a small group. It doesn't happen generally in a large group like this. Right? I mean, here it's, yeah, it's just not the environment. In a small group is where we can get closer, where we can connect. 
and powerful life change can happen. Now, I've talked enough, so I'm going to go to prayer. And we're going to pray over these four things, and then we'll, we'll be released to go, okay? Let's pray. Father, come Holy Spirit. We were praying Holy Spirit earlier. Lord, we just invite you into this. And Lord, I dedicate this message right now to every person here who is frustrated with just another year of no change. It doesn't have to be like that. This could be the year of change for you. God can make all things new. A brand new inside. Sandy, how do I do that? Well, you, it, you go to God. You draw near to him. Right now, I'm inviting you just to draw near to God in prayer and just pray. If you're already saying, hey, I'm close to God. I'm intimately worshiping with him. I'm very close. Then I'm thankful for that. But you be praying for the person next to you because not everybody is in that circumstance. Some of you need a, fre you need a fresh start. You just need a brand new experience. And this is, why not start 2017 that way? For the sake of the people you care about in your life, they need a brand new you too. Right now, this is a courageous thing. I'm not going to have you stand up and come forward or anything, but I'm going to ask you to pray right where you're at. Would you invite Christ into your life? Say, Jesus Christ, come into my life. Make me new inside. I'm not talking about joining a church right now talking about making a commitment to God to dedicate your life to Christ. See, I need a new me. And then say, God, I'm willing to go all in. No reservations. Say, God, I want to draw near to you. Teach me to be a worshiper, somebody who is enthusiastic about reading your word, spending time in prayer, getting involved in the fellowship of believers. But change me from the inside out. I don't need the external stuff. That doesn't work. I know that. Would you say, God, help me to hold on to your promises from your word, daily feeding Help me not to neglect my soul. Some of us, we, we understand that. We know it's important not to neglect certain relationships. We don't neglect maybe our exercise. There's things that, those are priorities. We want to eat the right thing. Are you eating spiritually the right thing? Say, God, I want to feed daily. I want to care about others and serve faithfully. And I want to be in part of an encouraging group. That's a big risk take for you. I know that. If you've never been part or maybe you've had a bad experience, it's a big risk take. I'm telling you, as you leave, I'm going to dismiss in just a moment. And as you leave here, you're going to be, you're going to go right by all those tables where our small group leaders are. And there's, I'm telling you, there is going to be a spiritual warfare happening. Part of you will say, hey, I'm too busy. I have things to do. But that's not true. Because if I kept praying for 20 minutes, you all would stay here. You'd be angry at me, but you'd stay. <laughs> you have a couple minutes. You can just go over. And test the waters. Win some Skittles. Or some other prize. Watch what God will do in your life. It's too important, friends, too important. Father, I thank you for everybody here who's making that commitment, saying, I want 2017 to be the best year of my life. Let it be so. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at and we'll see you next week.